Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 34 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and with me once again is my co-host, Pervez Ahmed. Hey, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us again. Uh, it's been a minute. Very excited to have with us uh, Dr. Ingrid Matson. Uh, was educated in Canada and in the United States, um, earning her PhD from the University of Chicago in 1999. Uh, from 1998 to 2012, she was professor of Islamic studies at the Hartford Seminary, where she also developed and directed the first accredited graduate program for Muslim chaplains. Really love to talk about that and served as the director of the McDonald Center for the study of Islam and Christian Muslim relations. Um, then uh, from 2001 to 2010, Dr. Matson served as vice president and then later as president of the Islamic Society of North America, ISNA, uh, the first woman to serve in that position. Um, her writings, both academic and public, focus primarily on uh, Quran interpretation, Islamic theological ethics, and interfaith relations. Um, she is presently senior fellow of the Royal Ahlul Bayt Institute of Islamic Thought in Amman, Jordan. And, uh, we're really excited to have you join us, Professor Matson. Welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. Excellent. And you join us now. Presently, you are on faculty at? Huron University College in London, Ontario. It's part of the uh, campus of uh, Western University in London. Correct. Um, so that is, is that sort of a return back to Canada? Because I, I, I take it you're originally from Canada? It is, it is. I lived uh, over 20 years in the United States uh, and I still, I come uh, pretty much every month. So I'm an Americanized uh, Canadian, <laughs> you could say, but it's uh, it's a good time to be back in Canada, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> you want to definitely get into some of that uh, a little later. So, uh, so, 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 so tell us a little bit about uh, your sort of early childhood. Uh, you were born and raised, I guess, spent your early life in Canada. Um, what part of Canada? Right. So I'm, I uh, grew up in southern Ontario mm. in a place called Kitchener, Ontario, which uh, mostly Sudanese know since uh, Lord Kitchener was the Viceroy of, uh, of uh, England mm. in Sudan, a very unpleasant character. Um, so that's a, a kind of embarrassing name to have uh, of my native city. Um, and uh, yeah, grew up a uh, big family, had a wonderful childhood, uh, Catholic education, elementary school, high school. Um, then I went on to uh, study philosophy and fine arts at the University of Waterloo. Uh, all of that before I came to the United States. Correct. So um, was it while you were in your undergraduate studies that you sort of first uh, uh, you sort of, you know, Islam kind of comes across your radar uh, and, and kind of piques your interest? Yeah, well, I was um, I was raised Roman Catholic, but mm -hmm. I left that tradition when I was uh, 15 years old um, and then subsequently had no religious identity or affiliation, wasn't any kind of seeker, wasn't really interested. I just kind of walked away from it and didn't think about it anymore. Um, but then I met uh, some Muslims from West Africa when I was studying in France uh, during my undergraduate education. Uh, they were, as far as I knew, the first Muslims I met. A lot of fun, beautiful, wonderful people. Uh, not, you know, strictly observant, but uh, just wonderful people. And they were the, f because they were the first Muslims I met, they really set the example for me of a, of just a, a good ordinary uh, Muslim. And I was interested in their background, um, their culture. I didn't know anything about it. So that's when I started reading up uh, about Islam. And, and does that sort of take you or um, why you decide to sort of study it beyond the undergraduate level. I, you know, I know you do your master's and PhD in Islamic studies at the University of Chicago. Well, what happened is, uh, to my surprise, as I, as I was reading about Islam, simply to learn more about my friends uh -huh. who were from Senegal. And so I was also reading West African literature and 
um, about their history and culture. Um, but when I started reading, uh, what I learned was their sacred book, the Quran. Um, I, to my surprise, found myself um, really having a very deep and compelling spiritual experience where I was reconnecting with God through this book. So, so I became a Muslim then at the end of my undergraduate education, and that really changed everything because I had been all set to continue with school. Um, probably I would have gone on to do an art history degree. Mm. Um, and, uh, but I became a Muslim and, um, started hearing a lot of strange things from other Muslims about what that meant now, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a kind of, uh, I call it bait and switch process where, uh, when you're learning about Islam, it, you're just given the, the simple and the easy and the beautiful stuff. And then once you become a Muslim, all of these different Muslims and Muslim groups are trying to force their agenda, their ideology, their school of thought on you. Right. And uh, it, it was not a very pleasant experience, but I was very fortunate that I went to uh, the University of Toronto bookstore looking for some books on Islam to make a bit of sense on it. And I found uh, Fazal Rahman's book, Islam. And uh, I read it. I was blown away. Right. And um, that was it. I said, I have to study with this man. Mm. That's remarkable. Uh, you know, um, in the past, we've had several, several of our guests um, in the past mention Dr. or some connection to Dr. Fazal Rahman, um, certainly directly Dr. Omar studying with him and doing his PhD with him at the University of Chicago. Um, but also some of our other guests as well. So um, I, I think if anything, our listeners have sort of taken away uh, those who aren't familiar with or aren't, haven't, haven't been introduced to the writings of Professor um, Fazal Rahman, hopefully they do so. Um, you so know, this, the strange thing, though, is, yeah. uh, you know, I wrote him a letter. This is, of oh. course, in the days before the Internet and email. Yeah. Uh, I wrote him a letter saying I wanted to study with him he wrote me back. I still have that letter. I have it right on my bookshelf beside my desk at home. He, he wrote back to me, inviting me to come study with him. Beautiful. And, um, it was just so exciting. But then, uh, I had a little, um, thing I had to do before going to graduate school, which is, uh, I had always wanted to do some relief or development work. So I went and I did that for two years before I went to Chicago. In the meantime, he had passed away. So I arrived at Chicago uh, without Fazal Rahman, but surrounded by his students and his legacy. And that was a very important lesson for me spiritually. And also, um, you know, I felt that although I felt a little bit orphaned at that point, I, looking back on it, um, I think it was in many ways good for me. And of course, he was a great scholar who left uh, all of his books Right. As well as his students and those who mentored him. So we have that, um, you know, access to that community of knowledge, which is wonderful. Right, right. So, so then you arrive in Chicago. I, so I just based on the time frame, we're talking early 80s because I think he passes away in 1981, I believe, right? No, no, no. Oh, no, I'm not that old. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I, arrived, I arrived there in 1989, and he had died the year before. Oh, that's right, 88. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, 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 right. Um, so then you're there, um, and and so by then, of course, um, Dr. Omar had already graduated. He, he was already done. Right, but Dr. Ahmed was this. Um, he was kind of a mythical figure. <laughs> um, everyone read his multi-volume, monumental uh, doctoral dissertation. Yeah. Sitting in the library was to fight for that. And we talked about him all the time. Everyone would be saying, well, where is he now? What's he doing? Uh, how could we access him? And um, it was, he was just such a topic of conversation. We were so intrigued because he was clearly such a genius. Uh, and and his ideas were so compelling. So a uh, number of years later, 
after I arrived at Chicago, I had the great pleasure of being approached by some um, some people in Chicago who had met Dr. Ahmed in Europe or in England and wanted to find a way to get him back to America and sponsor him um, through some kind of organization. And that was the development of the Nelwi Foundation. So when I heard his name and I was approached to see if I wanted to support this effort, I was I was simply overjoyed. And it was such an honor to be able to be involved with uh, Nelwi and have that chance to spend time with, with Dr. Ahmed for a number of years in Chicago. That's right. You, you, you served as, you, you were on the board uh, of directors, I believe, at Nelwi Foundation. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And um, uh, I, I think a connection to Zeki uh, is that his wife went on the trip with you and Dr. Armour and Dr. Jackson to China. Um, yeah, in 2002. Yeah, those were the best trips. I it, mean, right. uh, trips of, uh, it was, they were extraordinary for all of us. We had Dr. Ahmed. Uh, Sherman Jackson, um, uh, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, Timothy Winter was with us on some of those trips. I don't, I don't remember if he was on the China trip. Not China, but Not but China. Yeah, China was just the three of you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So I mean, it's just such a blessed company. Um, right. You know, for for all of us because we we had. Uh, very often when, I mean, each one of us, when we go someplace to teach or lecture, it's often just just work and a kind of uh, teacher-student relationship. But here we were traveling together um, as uh, scholars uh, and teachers. Um, certainly I wouldn't consider myself a peer of, of Dr. Ahmed. Um, so I had the chance to learn from him as I was uh, teaching as well. Um, it's just a, a really blessed time. Right, right. Um, yeah, I, I'd love to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, but I, I think we're, we're um, going back to your, um, your your experiences at the University of Chicago. Um, you, you focus your research uh, and writings on the Quran. I believe your dissertation had to do with the Quran, correct? No, actually, actually, what it wasn't. Um, my dissertation was on slavery and social status in early Islamic society and law. That's so my, my dissertation is called A Believer is Better Than an Unbeliever, mm. which is, which is uh, taken from the Quran, uh, a verse of the Quran. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at this issue of slavery and so social status and trying to um, understand why, if, if the Qur'an and the Sunnah were clearly in the direction, um, you know, what, what Fazl Rahman would call um, the, the, the kind of moral thrust of the Qur'an and the Sunnah was in the direction of equality and freedom, human freedom, why did uh, slavery continue to exist until uh, the 19th century in the Muslim world, and why uh, were many Muslim societies um, plagued by a, um, uh, a hierarchical kind of uh, division that affected uh, people's mobility and and really the idea of uh, human equality. So I think yeah, what I always advise people who are going to um, undertake um, a doctoral study is that the only way you can really get through it, because it's so grueling, it's so isolating, it's it's just such a difficult thing to do is that you have to have a, um, an issue that you just need to solve. You know, you have a question that is so compelling to you that you cannot sleep or eat until you get it, until you tackle this and you keep, it just keeps gnawing at you. And, and for me, it was that issue. And um, so it was, it was challenging, but it was uh, also satisfying to be able to devote that amount of time to that topic. Yeah, um, so did you, I mean, I, what was the sort of resolution to that in your, in your mind in terms of the way that, you know, you approached the topic and then, you know, the, like the research you explored? Um, you... Well, well, I'll tell you, I, I went into my study, um, you know, really committing myself to honesty. I said, Look, I have some core beliefs. I believe in God. I believe the Quran is the word of God. I believe that 
Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a messenger of God. Um, after that, I could accept that anyone else could be infallible, you know, is infallible. And that anyone else, uh, any other Muslim um, can make a mistake and has made many mistakes. So I, I, I didn't, I think this is part of the advantage of not growing up Muslim is I hadn't, um, I didn't have this, this uh, kind of Muslim identity issue. Islam wasn't, wasn't an identity uh, to me. I didn't link my self-esteem or my um, religious identity to the idea of a glorious Islamic civilization. Um, you know, I just didn't have all that baggage. So I think it made me able to, to really freely and honestly look at um, Islamic history um, in all of its beauty and ugliness where it was. And what, I mean, and I guess the, the short answer to what I discovered is that, um, and, and I think I was guided in this by, by Michel Foucault, who I studied uh, also as an undergraduate in my mm -hmm. uh, studies of philosophy, right. is that it wasn't about, um, uh, you know, identifying the person or a few people who had, who were evil or who created some kind of negative energy um, for, for Islamic society to go off the rails this way. Uh, it wasn't as bad as I thought. Um, it was a question of understanding structures and understanding how uh, there are unintended consequences of structures, but also how knowledge really is related to power. And um, it, it's important to understand that the, the scholarly class in Islamic civilization were um, were extraordinary people. I mean, in the end, you find you really admire their dedication, but like all people, they uh, also have interests, and they certainly had a corporate interest in maintaining the scholarly class because, really, for them and in, in their mind, and in reality, I think. Uh, they were the only thing between the ordinary people and tyranny. I mean, they had this, um, they had a kind of independence that they were insistent on maintaining. Right. And, but that's a compromise with power. Um, it means that they accept that um, political power is responsible for some things and, and they're, they can only be responsible for other things. So in terms of moral guidance, they were extraordinary. Um, in terms of upholding the law, they, they d did uphold it on an individual basis, but they had no ability to address systemic problems. Mm. Um, and, and something like slavery is a systemic problem. Um, it can't be dealt with piecemeal. They were constantly encouraging the good treatment of, of slaves, uh, the liberation of slaves, their emancipation, um, their, their judgments generally were very good and really uh, were in keeping with the spirit of treating these people primarily as human beings who had fallen into a, 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 this terrible state of slavery um, with the hope that, like every human being, they would one day be free again. So there wasn't this sense that there's a certain class of people who should be slaves or who are essentially slaves. No, they were human beings. Right. But they had they had no way of addressing the systemic problem, mm -hmm. and um, even some of their solutions probably uh, didn't make thing you know didn't help to move the system uh, towards a, a dismantling. So it's quite complicated, um, but it it shows us that um, you know none of none of these none of these problems of human dignity can be dealt with in a very simplistic way. They're complicated and have many angles, you know, economic, political. Right. Right. I, I think, yeah, I mean, it, 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 there's so much like that you un uncover there, but um, yeah, I, I, the idea of, you know, the, the sort of scholarly class uh, being the buffer, if you will, uh, between the ordinary people and the state, um, you know, I think that might come as a surprise to not only maybe our non-Muslim 
audience and listeners, but also our Muslim listeners, because oftentimes, you know, the way we've constructed uh, or, or the way Islamic civilization is often viewed is as this sort of, you know, theocracy where the scholarly class and and the state were in, 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 in you know, cahoots. And, and that's just his Islamic history or, or Muslim history just doesn't play out that way, where in fact, the scholarly class really saw themselves and maintained themselves, at, you know, in, con- in, in conscious opposition to the state. Well, unfortunately, um, uh, the situation changed during modernity. Right. And that's why, I that's mean, right. of course, we all believe that this is the case because this is how it's been for about maybe less than 200 years, but certainly over 100 years with the modern nation state Correct. Um, uh, and, and people like um, Wa'al Halaq have, um, have demonstrated this very clearly. Mm-hmm. Um, professor Wa'al Halaq uh, was at Columbia, a uh, professor of the history of Islamic law and legal theory, yeah. has, uh, has done a lot of research in this area and shows that, that we moved from, you know, a pre-modern, uh, a pre-modern empires and sultanates and and other forms of of uh, territorial authority that were um, quite uh, limited in their reach. I mean, they wanted law and order, but their means of exerting law and order were were pre-modern, so were limited. But they also, for for them, what law and order meant and what Sharia meant in most cases was uh, just maintaining peace among people and and the local norms and the local traditions and the means of resolving conflict were the were the first choice. You know, it wasn't this kind of top down authoritarian state. I mean, there was no such thing as a ministry of uh, endowments and religious affairs. In fact, the endowments for religious institutions and and educational institutions, were independent, and that that's what allowed their independence. It's when they were nationalized by these modern nation states that um, governments took almost totalitarian control uh, of religion. Right, right, exactly. Uh, yeah, I, I was I was speaking more about the sort of pre-modern era, like you mentioned. Um, uh, but I think also kind of worth noting, perhaps, um, that you know the institution of slavery. Uh, wasn't racialized like it was in sort of the you know the, certainly the American context um, when we when we see slavery in in, in in Muslim history. Well, there was I mean certainly uh, slavery wasn't considered to be the the um, divine state of some group of human beings. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was all human beings were considered to be essentially free. Which right. is why, if there was a foundling, for example, an abandoned baby, their legal status was always free, never slave, um, because freedom is the original status of any human being, no matter what their color is. Mm. Um, so, uh, slavery was, uh, you know, at least theoretically or conceptually, was the product of war, right. uh, war where you had, you know, far too many captives to do anything else with them. Um, unless they they all would be uh, executed, which is seem much less humane um, than taking them as captives. Now, um, you know, this is not to be apologetic for slavery in any, you know, by any means. It's just that there weren't a lot of choices for pre-modern people. Uh, that we have more choices now in, in warfare because we have the technology to be able to detain and hold. A couple thousand people um, in one place and feed them and water them and not have them, you know, end up with cholera. You need to take their sewage away. Right. Um, but even now, we still have some problems. I mean, there are a lot of people who are detained or confined in um, semi uh, penal uh, systems who are not being uh, well maintained and whose legal status is liminal because. Um, uh, it's always a challenge. What, you know, what do you do with the enemy when they still want to fight you? You know, who who do you release them to? How do you how do you release them without um, hurting yourself or having them just come back and attack others? By the way, this is one of the reasons why my favorite 
TV show is The Walking Dead because they're precisely dealing with this issue right. in this season about a determined enemy. And uh, if you know they're coming back to get you, what can you what can you do with them? Do you kill them or do you confine them? Uh, okay. What's moral in that situation? It's very difficult. Well, and can can you talk some more about about uh, your own journey in terms of uh, moving past your PhD into the Hartford Seminary? What what uh, took you there, and and uh, what you got out of that? Well, um, I um, as a graduate student, I was uh, always in touch with um, um, you know, ordinary life, ordinary communities. Uh, I had a family, I had children and a husband, and so we wanted to be part of Muslim communities and life, to have that religious life and to enjoy holidays and other things with them. So I never was just sitting in the library, although I spent a lot, most of my time there. <laughs> uh, but I was in communities too, and I knew um, that while my dissertation research was really focused on, um, uh, on a topic in, um, you know, legal theory and history and, and Islamic history and society, that I always, my questions were always oriented towards how do we, you know, in the background, how is this, how could this help us understand what we're supposed to do today as Muslims? So I'd always been interested in living Muslim communities and been involved in part of them. So uh, while I was finishing up my dissertation, I, I, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do. I, I knew that I was supposed to start applying for academic jobs. Um, I wasn't feeling that enthusiastic about it, but I would have gone and ha ahead and done it if I had not received a call. I mean, literally a phone call from someone, a friend of mine, who I studied with at the University of Chicago. Um, she's a well-known professor of Islamic studies, Marian Katz. Hmm. Um, and she called me at that time, she was teaching at Mount, Mount Holyoke, I believe, and said, uh, Ingrid, there's this job that I heard about that I think it would be perfect for. Um, I know people on the search committee, they asked me if I knew anyone would you be interested in it? And then she described this job at Hartford Seminary, which I knew of only because of the Muslim World Journal. Um, Hartford Seminary publishes the oldest English language journal dedicated to Islamic studies and Christian Muslim relations. Wow. So I knew that name, but I didn't know much else about it. Um, and they were looking for a Muslim professor who would be involved in uh, some form of uh, professional religious leadership training and education for Muslims. So it was, um, I was curious and uh, they said, can you meet us next week? You know, they were kind of at the end of their search and uh, it seems they hadn't quite found the person they wanted. So I said, okay, um, I went, met them, saw what they were doing and was really enthusiastic about it. Um, and that's how I arrived um, in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, with the mission to develop some kind of, of religious uh, leadership program for Muslims. Well, and and in terms of of your own journey now, you've you've uh, you you served as a president of ISNA from 2006 to 2010, and that was certainly at a time where the the profile of anti-Muslim figures ha had increased, although it, it seems lower then than it does now. I mean, now it's, it's almost become acceptable and mainstream. Uh, I would love to get your perspective on how things have changed in terms of how Islam and Muslims are talked about and discussed in the public sphere, which is something that you were dealing with, you know, uh, on the front lines of, so to speak. Yeah, um, it. I spent ten years pretty much um, dealing with this issue. I I was elected, um, so I went to Hartford Seminary in 1999, and then I was elected vice president of ISNA in 2001. Started that, um, took that responsibility 
uh, a week before September 11th. Okay, I was I was going to ask. What, yeah. What, yeah. So what what I had thought was going to be, you know, a standard kind of board position of a Muslim organization, it's a volunteer position where I would be going to, you know, uh, be having a having a, a meeting, a board meeting once a month, and going to some activities, suddenly uh, became something else. Um, the the demand for uh, Muslim voices for education on Islam, both for Muslims and for non-Muslims, was so critical because on the one hand we had these uh, uh, violent uh, extremists justifying their actions in the name of Islam, which was very confusing to many Muslims, and on the other hand, um, you know, there were people who were already ideologically hostile to Muslims, either for political reasons or religious reasons, or maybe just racial, because Islam is racialized, so they were, you know, white supremacists or others who um, who saw this as an opportunity hmm. to um, really hammer Muslims and Islam. And, uh, you know, if that sounds exaggerated, uh, it, it isn't, because I... Huh. Uh, you know, right away, I was reading their newsletters, um, publications. I remember getting, I, I must have been maybe because I was, had a subscription to something like The Nation or Mother Jones or something like that. I remember getting letters, solicitation letters for membership from um, atheist organizations saying, this is the time now to attack Islam because it's weak and we can really show how terrible religion is. Wow. Yeah, so that has only increased, and unfortunately, we have this, uh, um, you know, what it what is very clearly a mirroring process where the extremists on both sides um, simply reflect each other and reflect each other's violence and bigotry and and xenophobia and um, are are looking for political and military ways of hurting uh, the other side. So it's been, um, you know, it's just, it's very disheartening uh, uh, to see this. And, and we, we're living in such a violent time and such a time of vulgarity and meanness and deliberate misinformation and misunderstanding. And the thing that has made this so much worse is that really uh, the, the, the rise in the Internet <laughs> And the mm. widespread uh, um, availability of the internet coincided with this. Right. So before, where someone, you know, the only the only place they may have learned about Islam or heard about Islam is, you know, they might get a little snippet of the news, um, and read about it and feel confused. And if they were really motivated, maybe they'd go to the public library and look up something. Now all they have to do is open their computer. Google it, and they would see all of these Islamophobic, uh, all these Islamophobic websites would come up with misinformation, um, and uh, so it is just it is very difficult to crack into, you know that that Islamophobic tangled web of misinformation. At the same time, there's the other tangled web of uh, violent extremists misinformation right. about Islam. That's right. So it, it's, it, it means that, um, you know, there's no one naive anymore. There are no naive encounters. Hmm. Uh, when I first started public speaking in the late 90s, I would go to a church group or a community group, and um, they might have some impression of Islam and Muslims, maybe vaguely negative if they were aware of Middle East politics maybe somewhat positive if they had a neighbor or someone they worked with who was a nice Muslim, um, but they were open to learning or listening. Mm -hmm. um, by the mid 2000s, that was completely, it was a completely different dynamic. You know, I, I would speak to, I'd be invited to speak to a group and immediately, um, you know, in the question period, people would be asking, you know, throwing out all these terms, well, what about jihad? Right. What about and of course Talqiyah, How do how could we trust you? 
we know that Muslims are supposed to lie about their religion. They would say, so I can't even trust what you're saying. You, or they would say, well, you seem like a nice person, but it must be because, you know, you're you're a Westerner or you're not really like the rest of Muslims. So the dynamic is completely different. Right. Well, and to that to that point, I mean, there there are probably there might be people listening here who don't understand what tahiyya is, or you know, who've heard it and don't have a context for it. Maybe this is a good time to explain what that is exactly. Right. So it, it what it what it means is dissimulation or or kind of hiding something, um, and it is it's. Uh, the, the Islamophobes have made it into some kind of article of faith of Islam, which it is not whatsoever. Um, Muslims are required by the Quran to be honest, to be trustworthy. The Prophet Muhammad said that um, uh, a, a believer cannot be a liar. Um, so lying is absolutely forbidden. Breaking your oath is are forbidden. All of these things. This is a very strong, strong principle that pervades the Quran and the Sunnah. Um, there, it is true, however, that if someone is uh, being, if their faith is, uh, if their life is under threat, um, if they are subject to torture, um, persecution, that they that they cannot bear, that they um, uh, that they could conceal their religion. So this came out of the time um, when early Muslims were being persecuted, and in particular, the the verse of the Quran that that talks about the person who, who's not held accountable for denouncing their faith if they're, tort if they're under duress is, is a young man, um, Amar, who was tortured along with his parents, um, Yasser and Sumaya and Mecca, for being Muslim and they were, they were slaves, his parents were slaves, and the three of them were tortured. His mother was sexually violated um, in the torture and killed, so they were both murdered in front of his eyes and so he as a young man then said okay i'll say whatever you want me to say mm -hmm. he felt very bad he felt that he when they let him go after this he felt that he had lost his soul and when he came to the prophet muhammad devastated the prophet muhammad's um, who had no way of protecting him at this time um, he had no means of protection he had no political authority said to him if if they come for you again say the same thing uh, meaning that you're not supposed to, um, you know, you don't have to um, allow yourself to be tortured to death um, when God knows what's in your heart. And then Muslims use this um, um, exemption again during the time of the Inquisition after the Reconquista of Ferdinand and Isabella in Spain, and they were persecuting and torturing uh, uh, people who had... Um, Muslim and Jewish backgrounds, by the way, right. uh, trying to see if they were true Christians or true Catholics, and uh, because you had to either be Catholic or leave, and many people didn't want to leave their home, and they were hoping that that somehow they would be allowed religious freedom again in the future. So they went along and pretended they were Catholic, but they were subject to the Inquisition, and many were tortured, of course, to death and burnt to death. Um, but this was uh, brought in as an exemption, and that really set the theme in, you know, um, the Catholic Spain of Ferdinand and Isabella is the first, many scholars would say, the first fascist state, the first fascist modern nation state. Wow. Um, and it was this totalitarian controlling state. Um, but it set also the tone for pre-modern Europe of, of what a Muslim is. So it was really this idea that Muslims are, are sneaky people who they pretend to be, uh, you know, they tend to be good Christians, but they're really Muslims underneath. Um, and uh, um, so if we look historically, we, we see that idea of the of the um, deceptive Muslim continuing, and mm -hmm. by the way, also the deceptive Jew. So this right. is a very common trope of anti-Semitism, European anti-Semitism, is that the Jew is is hiding his true intentions, that he's plotting to, you know, overthrow Western civilization or or Christian civilization, etc. So so Muslims and Jews have shared this. Um, 
have shared this uh, this idea of being um, untrustworthy mm -hmm. um, in the uh, anti-Semitic and Islamophobic um, rhetoric of, of uh, European civilization. Well, and, and I mean, in in terms of your own experience, uh, d you know, the, the ten years that that you were uh, do, doing this work with Isna, I mean, from from what you're describing, it was a disheartening experience. Is, is would that be an accurate uh, description? Certainly, it was disheartening in that way. On the yeah. other hand, there were wonderful, great, tremendous things that happened, and. We have to remember that, that the Holy Quran says, maybe you hate something and it's good for you. Sure. So in the sense that it was, it was tremendously hard, but it also, it also brought the best out in the best people. And, and I saw that among Muslims and among people of other faiths and no faith. So we saw um, that as, as this was happening, first and foremost, and this is important, that Muslims, ordinary Muslims, were standing up for true Islam, the true voice of Islam against the extremists. So I was just flooded with requests from ordinary Muslims and communities for education. I had this influx of students at Hartford Seminary of ordinary Muslims, some retired Muslims who came out of retirement, or women who up until that time um, we're not, uh, we're, we're, you know, just in the mosque serving some, you know, tea and biryani or, you know, on, on, on potluck nights who said, I can no longer let these extremists speak for me. I need to learn more about my religion. And they came and they did degrees and they studied and then they went out and they, ha you know, developed the strong voice. And all over America, we saw that, you know, with things like um, ING, the Islamic Networks Group, which is a wonderful Speakers Bureau organization. Um, they saw this huge increase in demand among Muslims um, to, to learn more about Islam and be able to articulate, first and foremost, to themselves, to their families, to their communities, what is the true message that is pluralistic, um, that it is supportive of democracy, loyalty, all of these things. So to me, uh, you know, it, it, it um, stimulated this incredible um, growth, uh, mature, intellectual maturity, spiritual maturity, and a sense of responsibility among American Muslims that, you know, no one else is going to, is going to do this for us. We need to get a grip and articulate our own vision of Islam and establish institutions that are going to reflect those values. So we also saw this tremendous growth in new kinds of Islamic organizations from, you know, doing social justice and free um, medical free clinics and all of these, um, all of these efforts that were just really th that show what Islam is really about. And at the same time, um, again and again and again, we saw uh, leaders of the Jewish community of the uh, of different Christian denominations, of um, you know secular people um, uh, in in civil rights uh, organizations and social justice organizations stand up and say we want to be partners with you in this good work, we want to amplify your message, we want to be um, loudspeakers for you to our communities and our religious congregations about what Islam is and what Muslims are because we don't want you know we don't want our people to um, be, be bi uh, biased and bigoted towards Muslims. Um, and so that gives me tremendous encouragement. I think we're far better than we ever were before in terms of our own knowledge, um, our, our, our maturity in taking responsibility for our community and in having really principled partnerships with our allies. So it's not only about us, but um, it, you know, the Quran says, "Ham jaza and ihsan and an ihsan is a reward for goodness other than goodness." And so Muslims um, are also reciprocating, advocating for the rights of other people, not just for their own rights in this context. So all of that is tremendously um, encouraging, and is the lesson for us about uh, the good that can come out of a bad situation. Right. Right. I agreed, I, and I think. Yeah, I mean, to have you sort of see that from the vantage point of your leadership role at ISNA 
because I mean, really, if you look at the time period there, I mean, that's really where you see, like you said, the sort of expansive um, nature of Muslim community or of the Muslim community sort of responding to, but at the same time going well beyond, um, you know, what was happening, you know, post 9-11. So um, I think that's, I think that's very, very fascinating. Um, if I could maybe shift the discussion a little bit uh, in the time that we have left um, to sort of maybe within the Muslim community and going back perhaps a little bit to your work um, at Hartford, at, at the Hartford Seminary, uh, with regards to the chaplaincy program, um, you know, I, I'd love for you to sort of comment on what you see as the needs that we have as a Muslim community in terms of like, because I mean, you know, it's one thing to have a qualified imam per se, who is say, you know, a scholar, a scholar in, in, in his or her own right, um, uh, you know, has the requisite training in scripture and so on, uh, but not having this sort of training and background in pastoral care, um, which, you know, when I think of a chaplaincy program, that's really what I, what, what, what I think of. Um, so I'd, I'd love for you to sort of talk about that a little bit in terms of the needs of the Muslim community in having leadership who is not only trained academically uh, in, 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 you know, as a scholar or in the Islamic sciences, but also really, you know, this need to, 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 to be able to deliver pastoral care to, to, to the growing community? Uh, this is uh, such an urgent need. It's right. not only pastoral care, it's individual counseling. Yeah. It is um, care for uh, people where they are in society, whether that's in the mosque, in a hospital, in a prison, on the streets, or confined to their home. Mm -hmm. um, what is the point of community? I mean, I really think we need to step back and say, what is a jama? What is a congregation? What does it mean? Why do we even come together for community? Of course, we need to find some place where we can get together to pray um, in congregation. All right, check. We have that. Uh, we need to learn uh, what is necessary for a religion. But in the end, um, you know, this is, we have to, I think it it would be helpful for American Muslims to think, and, and really Muslims globally, to think again about uh, the kind of congruence between political systems and social systems. So mm -hmm. because political systems in the Muslim world, in, in the modern age, have become so top-down, and Autocrat. centralized, yeah. right? And we, we took this, so we adopted this top-down centralized model for our religious communities. So true. That, that's not a natural way of, of, of living and of being together. Right. The, the, what we need to do is to strengthen, is to give support to the natural relationships that exist in society. And that means, it means couples, it means parents and children, it means extended family, it means neighbors, and to strengthen those systems and then find the gaps and have ways to serve the people who are in the gaps. Like for example, you know, we have this very strange idea where we think that giving a lecture is the solution to every problem, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Like if you're, okay, if your problem is loneliness, if your problem is that you have no one um, to eat dinner with, or you wake up on Eid and you live alone and you go to pray, eat prayer, and there's everyone's with their family and you have no one to celebrate with, your, your problem is not lack of knowledge, lack of information, lack of encouragement, it's lack of people in your life. It's, right. it's lack of connection. And so we need to really shift our focus to connecting people and supporting people. And that can only be done with people, not with buildings, not with, you know, with all due respect, knowledge. I'm a scholar. Knowledge is important. Right. But um, proportionally, what are the number of instit institutes and lectures and, you know, knowledge retreats that we need? compared to um, 
human resources for counseling support and presence you know it's really about being present with people as they go through the challenges of life we do not have enough people um i mean many muslims just think they don't think of it if they have their own family if they have their own family and circle of friends they don't feel that absence but uh, we live it's not you know it's not only converts it's not only people are divorced or single but we live in an incredibly mobile society most americans are going to move half a dozen times at least in their life for work for school for all sorts of reasons and they're going to be disconnected you know they're not going to be living in that neighborhood that they grew up in uh for the rest of their life so who's the person and and how what are the systems for um supporting them and checking in on them it can't be you know just some kind of drop box the imams of the mosque they only have a certain amount of time and the needs are not all in the mosque i mean what do you do for example about the the for example i had a friend uh one of the places i lived who had two uh, severely autistic children in the home she could never really bring them out to Islamic events because uh, there wasn't a tolerance for, um, you know, the behaviors that were natural to them. She's extremely isolated at home. Uh, why would we not have something like a visiting uh, uh, a chaplain corps, you know, home-based home chaplains, like we have visiting nurses or home nurses who go around and visit and spend time with and even pray with um, people who are in their homes and can't get out uh, to the community, and there are so many of them. It's, um, uh, I mean, I think most people would be shocked if they uh, actually undertook the effort of trying to uh, calculate and to, and and um, find these kinds of people. Right, right, and. Yeah, I mean, you bring up so much, but I mean, if I could just respond, like the uh, the kind of spirit, you know, the the kind of spiritual bypassing, right, that you kind of mentioned, which is like, oh, you know, the cure for loneliness or depression is more knowledge, or just come and you know, or or, or you know, pray pray this or fast, you know, and and that should take care of like real human needs that people have, right? Um, and I think that the, 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 the propensity to do that, I think, is informed by this, you know, by, by the fact that, unfortunately, we have people who aren't trained in, like you like in counseling and being present with people and, and, and really addressing the needs of, 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 of a community, certainly, you know, in, in modern America, as it were, with the challenges that we confront. Yeah, it's, it's not only that, it's that, um, I, I, I mean, I have a lot of sympathy for imams. Yeah, they're, oh, of course. They're overworked, underpaid, right. um, disrespected, yeah. um, subject to completely arbitrary rules that change every time there's a new board election. <laughs> so it really is the community's I, fault when they don't have, um, you know, when there's a mismatch here. But many, many imams... Some imams really are pastoral people, and this is their gift, is connecting people. Right. Many imams of our mosques, however, are really want to be scholars. So they're good, they're good at scholarship, they're good at teaching. They actually don't have the gift of pastoral care. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's interesting because there's uh, many of the people who have a deep gift in that are, are not only men, but women. You know, it seems to be something that maybe women, because in their sort of stages of life, often have to really pay pay very close attention to the human needs of, of others, that they might kind of naturally develop this gift. And here I see a wonderful opportunity for uh, bringing in the, the um, you know, the, the gifts of service of Muslim women great more into our community um, to bring. I, I, I've said for a long time that every Islamic center should have a, a female chaplain, mm -hmm. uh, a female uh, spiritual caregiver. That, that would also not only would that bring that that presence into the mosque, but also it would um, uh, it would help with this problem we have of, of what um, 
Sheikh Hazina Bansari calls blurred lines. You know, mm. we, we do have an issue where uh, some religious, some of these people in charge do not know their professional boundaries. Um, and they're crossing the line when it comes to uh, interacting with women. So if we had female uh, chaplains trained um, uh, in the community, yeah. even even in the mosque, and able to go not just stay in the masjid or the Islamic center, but to go out to the community from that, I think that would do a great deal um, to um, to prevent um, some of the problems that are happening because there would be that that additional professional uh, to whom uh, the community is accountable. Right. And and to go back to your point about like sort of the kind of centralization model that has been adopted by, you know, by a lot of by a lot of the communities, you know, th that I think not only has to do with leadership, but also um, has to do with the fact that, you know, that we can't have spaces beyond just the mosque or the Islamic center. And I think kind of one of the things that we're seeing of late is the development of so-called third spaces, right, that we see in our communities where, um, you know, that aren't sacred like mosque spaces, but at the same time are, are places where our community, members of our community can come together and uh, break bread, can just, you know, share a sense of community that are outside of the mosque. I, I mean, I, I think there's an advantage, but they're not a magic bullet. Because right. they also need to be subject to the same scrutiny and oversight. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, some of these places um, really become, um, you know, they're sort of places where, uh, again, we fall into the same trap of uh, one person, one man, no oversight, no supervision, no accountability, or the appeal of charismatic authority. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the problem. I mean, I don't think it's the spaces. Really, uh, the, 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 the mosques, um, you know, the mosques should be places where this can happen, but we can also socialize anywhere. We don't need a, a separate space. You could, you know, rent a table at the library or, I don't know, just hang out in a restaurant. I'm right. really talking more about the, the relationships. So it's the people. Mm -hmm. And wherever the people, you, you know, wherever they're based it doesn't really matter they they could be they could be home based but the question is not just sitting somewhere waiting for someone to come to you but you going out to them yeah. but but with accountability and supervision because we're talking about human people's vulnerability yeah. um and as we know that that predators or people who are are going to exploit you know, there are always people who are going to exploit vulnerabilities and they flourish in an environment where there isn't accountability and supervision. Yeah. So I'm less concerned about the spaces than about the relationships, uh, increasing the relationships, increasing the professionalization of the people who offer services right. and um, but making sure that there is uh, accountability and oversight for that. Yeah, absolutely. No, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a wonderful point. Um, so, uh, I guess then, um, you transition out of your role at, at the Hartford Seminary, um, and now you're, um, back in Canada. Um, are you focusing more on research, um, still involved in some capacity, uh, with the, uh, cha with, with the A chaplaincy program? Well, I, uh, here, this is a new chair in Islamic studies that I took. Um, again, subhanAllah, I'm, I'm really blessed. I feel that God's always um, directing me because I, I tend to be a rather careless person and completely lacking in ambition, so I never think about the next step. So literally, <laughs> again, I got a phone call saying, we have this new chair um, and we think you'd be good for it. Would you please come? Would you please put in an application? <laughs> and... Um, so I, I wasn't looking to go anywhere, but I, I, I felt a, a certain sense of responsibility, both to my home country, to mm -hmm. my extended family uh, from, you know, I, I'd only been a visitor for so many years. Um, but I am so Americanized too, so it was difficult, but I'm, I'm only an hour from the border. <laughs> so right, right. so I'm, 
I, I'm, I'm here in Canada, but I'm, I'm in the United States at least once a month, if not more. So I'm, I really am binational, I think. But I, I wanted to see also how Islam is being lived here. Um, and, and when you live in America, it's so easy to forget that there are other countries in the world um, that may do things a little bit differently. And, and it is different here. Um, Canada is kind of um, somewhere between the American and the European model. Yeah. So there are some things that are much easier here when it comes to being a Muslim and some things that are, that are somewhat more challenging um, or need to be done differently. And I, I like, I have a, um, a bit of an entrepreneurial personality. I like to take on new things and, and try to figure out um, some new models or methods or avenues for um, for knowledge and learning and, and connection. And so I'm enjoying that. And I'm thinking deeply about what it means to be a human being in the world today, what it means to be a believer and a member of a religious community when we are in a time of, of great mobility uh, with no end in sight. I mean, I think we've simply mm -hmm. shifted into a new era in human history, not only post-national, but a, a, I would say the era of mobility. So what does that mean in terms of, um, of loyalty and of responsibility to the place where you are for that time? Um, you know, I used to think about this uh, as a Canadian in America, was I, was I supposed to suddenly become really super excited about a flag? That, that wasn't my, you know, that didn't make me excited. What did make me excited were my neighbors and the institutions and the people around me who um, I, I worked with. So I felt this deep sense of loyalty. And wherever I go, I, I, I find myself being deeply loyal to the people around me, trying to understand their customs and norms and to find the way to continue to be myself, yet also, um, adjust what I do to help to help smooth the you know the the, the gears of, of society of just helping to create a society where people feel uh, a sense of harmony um, and so what does that mean for this idea of identity religious identity and national identity so that's really what I've been working on um, the idea of belonging um, and uh, my tentative conclusion is we really have to go back to the understanding that that Islam is a deeply embodied religion, uh, meaning that rather than living in our heads or some kind of ideal concept of identity, we have to focus back to where our feet are. And after all, anytime we go someplace, the first thing we have to do is figure out where we are in the world, right? Where's the direction of, of Mecca? Where's the Qibla? Um, so we have to know where we are and then we have to get water to wash ourselves. So what's our water source? It has to be pure. Do we know where we're getting our water from? Mm. Um, so this idea of, of being really grounded where we are at the time um, and, and from our body um, reaching out um, and, and understanding the ethical responsibility of everything we touch, everyone we touch, everything, everyone we impact, whether that's the, the trash that we throw out or, um, you know, what we put on our lawns or uh, um, how we greet people on the street, whether we're making them comfortable or uncomfortable, um, whether we're contributing to a happy society or, or, adding to the misery of people. Um, I think that it's, it, we need a much more natural understanding of belonging. And I think it's perfectly in accord with the Quranic message and what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, embodied in his life, which was, which was presence. He was so focused yeah. on where he was and who was uh, around him and what they needed. That's beautiful. And I think that's a great place to leave this conversation. I think uh, you you wrapped up so much of what we were talking about in in uh, those words that you just said. So thank you for that. Right. 
Um, I also, uh, Dr. Matson, I wanted to uh, just on a personal level, you know, the uh, your article in the study Quran, you know, sort of commend you on that, on how to read the Quran. I think it was a wonderful introduction. I often recommend it to not only other Muslims but just my fellow non-Muslim sort of coworkers and and you know and people in the in, in the community want to learn about the Quran in general. I, I feel like it's a wonderful starting point for people. Oh, I'm glad it was helpful. It was a, it's an honor to be included in in that effort. It's a, yeah. a, a wonderful effort. It's a great resource. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm looking forward to the second edition when they when they take my advice <laughs> for some changes. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. Right. Hopefully, they'll yeah. keep the essay. <laughs> it's certainly been not without controversy, but as these things go, um, it's 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 kind of interesting actually. We we uh we, we had Professor Lombard on the show, and then. You know, who obviously we went into quite great length in terms of how that whole how the whole project came about, and then, um, like as I mentioned earlier, the episode with Dr. Omer, um, Dr. Omer had nothing but wonderful praise for it. But you know, as these things go in our community, you know, people have different reactions. But I think that, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I too, like yourself, am looking forward to the next edition. See what see how that changes things. Yeah, but I am using this edition for my for my uh, class now, my Quran class. As Wonderful. This, this is the reference, and they're finding it really helpful. I, I agree. Yeah. Well, it's been great speaking with you. Likewise. And so uh, before we leave, uh, where can people find you online, Dr. Matson? Um, your writings. I know you're on Twitter, if you don't mind sharing that. Uh, I, 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 I love following my, you on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, my website is ingridmatson.org. Very easy, I-N-G-R-I-D-M-A-T-T-S-O-N dot O-R-G. And uh, I think that's my Twitter handle, too. Okay, great. Uh, and Zeki, where can people find us and uh, leave us feedback? Well, you can go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Diffuse Congruence, and uh, leave us any comments there. You can also email us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. And, of course, go to iTunes, go to Stitcher Radio, go to TuneIn Radio. Leave a comment, leave a star rating, let us know how we're doing. Let us know uh, your thoughts on either this episode or previous ones, and we will be sure to share those on upcoming episodes. Uh, but with that, uh, it's a good place as any to wrap things up. So on behalf of Pervez Ahmed and our guest, Dr. Ingrid Matson, my name is Zaki Hassan. This has been Diffuse Congruence. Thank you for listening. Thank you.